Atlantis is known across the world as a tale from fable, but is this really the truth? Wherever we go and into whatever cultural history we delve, we discover a story similar to the one we know about Atlantis. Why would this be? Finding the key to this strange conundrum is something thousands of men and women across the globe have struggled to do but there are good reasons for their lack of concrete discovery. They have all been looking in the wrong place, at the wrong people, and for the wrong thing. For too long, historians have focused on a few words left to us by Plato and misunderstood what he was really telling us. The fact is, even Plato didn't understand what had been told to him. What about joining the dots? Across the world there are remnants and legends of a mystical past, left undiscovered by our misunderstanding. The real Atlantis can and will only be discovered by seeing the bigger picture, because Atlantis is all around you right now. From Lemuria to Avalon, from Atlantis to Valhalla, the real journey starts now. Forget everything you have been told. Throw out the preconceptions about an island of circles that sank beneath the waves and open your mind to a brand new possibility that Atlantis was much, much more than you could ever imagine. This is the story of the real Atlantis. This is the real lost history of mankind itself. This is the tale of a mass migration of people such as the world has never seen. Anybody who has had even a slight interest in Atlantis will be familiar with the many regular theories. Islands in the Mediterranean, submerged islands off the coast of Africa, strange lands to the far north, and even the Himalayas. There are good reasons for all these, and as we shall see, all have an element of truth. But for just a moment, let us consider something very strange and bizarre. Let us imagine that Atlantis, the name, may have something to do with Mexico. A Greek myth emerging from the other side of the Atlantic. Well, look at the names for that place before it became known as Mexico.
Itlan, Otlan, Atlan, Otlan, Mazatlan, Kakatlan, and Tolan, all sounding remarkably similar to Atlan Tis. Our one true source for the name Atlantis comes from the Greek philosopher Plato. He places Atlantis beyond the pillars of Heracles. This is at a place we now know as Gibraltar, and the only thing beyond there are the Americas. He says it is larger than Libya, which was seen as most of Africa to Plato. Any sight of an atlas will show that the Americas match this description. It was said to be a great empire stretching for miles, and with each passing year our archaeologists and scientists saw further uncovering huge landscapes previously thought to be uninhabited, and which now reveal the signs of having been lived in and cultivated on a massive scale. Also, we can see from around 6000 BC that the Harappan culture of India, the pre-Indian civilization, was a great seafaring society. Surely, there has to be more proof that these cultures spread across the seas and traded religious ideas, if not more. Well, there is a lot more. The ancient boats used by the Chinese, Japanese and Indians were sampans. This is interesting because in South America the tribes of the coast call them Mayo Chimpana, Shanpan and Sampan, virtually the same term for vessels across the world. This idea of common languages would be easier to discover had not the invading European countries virtually destroyed them. However, there are still plenty of similarities in structure and meaning to make the case. From the very names of places, such as Atlan and Otlan, that the letters Tlan are common. In Indian folklore, the serpent ancient masters known as Nagas were said to reside in Patalan, we can see this fabled land of the serpent people in the very language, and especially when we consider the similarities in the worship of the serpent across the world and in South America. In fact, certain Venezuelan Indians, known as Pariah, actually lived in the area known as Atlan. These Pariahs were believed to be white-skinned and possessed folklore of a great cataclysm that destroyed their original homeland.
In Sanskrit, which is widely thought to be the root of the world's languages, Tala is surface, and the N refers to the people living there. So Talan is the people of the surface. The A suffix denotes below or no longer. So Atalan is the people below the surface, just like Atlantis, which supposedly sank beneath the waves. Virtually the same meanings apply in the Mexican Nahatl language. Amazingly, Tala is also a name for the Hindu god Shiva, and therefore Talan means the people of Shiva, the people of the serpent god who lived below the surface. Vera Cruz in the Americas is said to be derived from Ver la Cruz, which is Spanish for seeing the cross. Not an unusual thought considering this was a symbol of the feathered serpent saviour, Quetzalcoatl. However, in Sanskrit, Vera Cruz means simply Cruz the hero, a title for the tribe which is said to have disappeared from India following the deluge, indicating through language alone that there must have been contact especially when we consider the rest of the data. But how did they transport themselves? Possibly on sampans, which we have seen are the same. But also, the saviour deity Quetzalcoatl and the god Vishnu or Shiva are both said to have travelled to Patala via an eagle and a raft of snakes. These snakes on the raft were nothing more than the terrifying images of dragons and serpents so often seen on ships, coming directly through time from the Indian, Harappan and Phoenician vessels and seen also in the Norse Viking dragon-headed longboats. The dragon is simply a winged, powerful serpent, also seen in China on boats and in traditional festivals. Quetzalcoatl disappeared back to Tlalpalan the place of the people of Pala, which is actually Bihar in India. From this place it was considered that the world's greatest architects and builders emerged after the flood and they spread across the globe. In all likelihood, they are ultimately responsible for the world's serpentine related stone megaliths and monoliths such as Avebury in England and the serpent mounds of North America. These people are known as the Watchers or Shining Ones in the Bible and are responsible for raising great stone monuments across the world. These are the people of Atlantis. The very word Atala, used as an abode of these serpents, also means pillar, and Atala was deemed the pillar of the world. This is an astronomical device to map the tilt of the Earth's axis. The Hindus mixed, traded with and respected the Greeks from where the myth of Atlantis arose in the modern world. As we can see in Taxila, there were great cross-cultural mixing pots and hives of religious and philosophical debate, and indeed it is highly likely that the stories of Atlantis evolved from Hindu myths such as the story of the capital of Krishna, which sank.
The age of the serpent goes back to and beyond the deluge and was taken across the seas to the Americas. Even the architecture of Atlantis, with its many circular banks and ditches, brings to mind the thousands of cup and ring marks, spirals and other serpent shapes seen on liths across the world. Jeffrey Ash in The Ancient Wisdom says, According to one theory, all primordial serpents of myth are derived from a Sumerian arch serpent in subterranean waters whose name was Zu. Water is, by many myths around the world, the home of the serpent spirit, and water serpents are generally healers. For instance, in a lagoon near Gimbo, Amburi, in Africa, there was a serpent which would cure madness, and in an Algerian well, there was a serpent deity taken over by a Muslim saint, which was said to cure sore eyes. This links with the ideas once prevalent in Palestine and Syria that the waters were often associated with the annual Rajab festivals, which honour the serpent that resides in the holy waters. There are many hundreds of such myths across pagan Europe, changed and altered by the later Christian church, who by their meddling eroded the real history of the Atlanteans that spread their serpent worship and knowledge across the world. Serpent water deities were replaced with saints, such as Brigid. The Naga serpent masters of ancient India were also said to live beneath the waters in Patala and they were expert healers. And springs such as Epka and Palmyra were named after the serpent deity residing there. In Greek myth, the serpentine god Poseidon and the serpent Typhon were water and spring deities, with many watery places taking on their names. Even in the temples of Aesculapius, we find the pools of a healing, a healing which is directly associated with the serpent. This element of the healing serpent within the water simply crossed over into the water itself and thereafter the water became the healing element. Added to this the concept that water was seen as the portal to the other world and we have an association of the water of the gods healing mankind. Beneath the temple in Jerusalem there is the serpent pool or dragon pool. What was it for? nobody is quite sure. It may be that here lay the Hebrew secret of the healing water in the name Serpent. This is the upper pool called today the Birkat El Mamilla. It is the Dragon Well of Nehemiah 2.13 and the Serpent Pool of Josephus War 5, 3 and 2. This pool, which lies in the northwest of the city, was later renamed the Pool of Hezekiah by the serpent bashing king himself. The Gnostic Jews, known as the Essene, were said to have used pools to heal, and they are connected to the healing serpent in many ways. It may indeed be that baptism has its roots in the idea of the healing serpent, being born again to new and eternal life by being submerged into the waters of the serpentine other world. An indication that this may be true is found in the fact that baptism has its roots in other ancient societies such as India. Here, the initiate was dipped three times into the sacred waters. In Greece, they even kept a holy vessel which carried the sacred waters of the healing serpent. The Egyptian Horus was baptised by Anu the baptizer, and so the origin of baptism is much older than we previously understood. 
and as we can see, it is firmly rooted in civilizations which are central to the development of the serpent worshipping cult, namely Egypt and India, and the origins of the myth of Atlantis. A larger version of this basic truth is seen in the story of the Flood, the deluge that sank Atlantis, and other fabled lands across the world. In Indian lore, the many-headed serpent Vishnu tells Manu about the coming deluge, and so saves mankind from certain death, only to be symbolically reborn again after the deluge and from the waters. It is the serpent which has the powers to create the chaos of the flood and the serpent which can save, in the same way that it has the venom to kill and the venom to cure. Surely, associating the serpent upon sarcophagi and funeral items brings the idea out that it is the power of the serpent which will once again bring new life, whether in this world or the next, and to the person contained within. In Bali, the Naga serpent worshippers even burn a serpent with their dead to give him new life. The place that many great legendary figures go to after or near death is often associated with the waters to place where the fairies or serpent spirits reside. They are given life eternal via the snake. It is only after the power of the snake has left you that your life ends. As Porphyry related that when Plotinus died, the snake emerged from beneath his bed. The snake had left and taken his protection away. This myth can clearly be seen today in our modern sci-fi show, Stargate. We turn now to another fabled land that has been related to Atlantis by many scholars. Lemuria is a fabled island, much like Atlantis, but with a lesser pedigree. The name and concept came from a German zoologist called Heichel in the 1860s. At the time, the idea of land bridges as distribution routes for different species of animals was popular. Heichel was interested in the dispersion of the lemur from Madagascar to Sumatra and proposed Lemuria as a land bridge linking Madagascar, India and Sumatra. It would have been as simple as that, had not the infamous Madame Blavatsky intervened in her book Secret Doctrine. She made Lemuria the home of the root race, our ancestors of about 60 million years ago. This race, she insisted, were giant ape-like hermaphrodites that fell when they finally discovered sex. The sight of Lemuria changed from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific due to people like Frederick Spencer Oliver and Colonel James Churchward. The evidence being islands such as Easter Island and Panape. There is no evidence of a sunken continent in the Pacific. There is evidence that coastlines of many South East Indian landmasses have dramatically changed due to sea level fluctuations associated with the last ice age. Nobody of any ilk is today peddling the Lemuria myth, but the reason Blavatsky and others found evidence for an ancient root race is simple. They actually did exist, and they did spread knowledge around the world. They didn't need a land bridge. They had boats. A 
And so we can see from language, mythology, history and folklore that the people we are calling Atlanteans spread across the world, possibly following some cataclysmic event, and took with them knowledge of the healing serpent, astronomy, navigation and more. Can we still see what they left behind and what was the purpose? The answer is yes we can. Let's start with the biggest, the pyramids. In his paper, The Great Pyramid Texts, Klesson Harvey points out that in the pyramids of Saqqara, there are over 3,000 columns of texts from the 5th and 6th dynasties, which he believed hold the secrets to the pyramid's use. These texts include incantations and magic formula that were obviously invoked in certain locations around the pyramid. However, in one of these pyramids, and in the upper passage chamber, gallery and shaft, is an incredibly old, unmistakable megalithic glyph. Klesson's interpretation is that the glyph or phrase translates remarkably into star door and tunnel opening gate. Short of the fact that glyphs are sadly lacking from most pyramids, and the Great Pyramid is an example, this information is a startling discovery in relation to our theories. Indeed, there was probably more information which has now been destroyed, as when Herodotus was said to have visited Egypt in the 5th century BC, the outer casing of the Great Pyramid was awash with hieroglyphs. Egyptologists claim that the star is mythological and leave it at that. This tunnel and star door is really the entrance to the shamanic other world. A star and shining are intimately linked in meaning, with one having emerged from the trance experience as triggered by the shamanic activity. The Egyptians called the area of Giza where the Great Pyramid is situated, Rostau, meaning gateway to the Duat, or other world. And it was this Rostau effect which could turn a man into a god. What was the purpose of all this? The ancient shaman or priests were the ones who contacted the gods on behalf of the people. They did this through altered states of consciousness. This ability and the knowledge of navigation via the stars made them appear to be special. They were the magicians with their long staffs used for navigation and their wisdom symbolized by the wise snake. These were the Shining Ones, the Atlanteans. So how did the pyramids and other great structures play into this role? How did the pyramid work in this respect and in relation to the trance state or altered consciousness? And furthermore, were there any additional buildings or structures in the world which were constructed as a means to facilitate these experiences? And if so, how? The stories of Atlantis, the fables surrounding it, and other mythological lands always have the people as special, in touch with the gods, powerful. First of all, perhaps we should look for any evidence of these mysterious structures having some metaphysical function we are unaware of, which could be explained scientifically. Maybe a link with human consciousness in some way.
After having identified the experience which has been behind the religious impulse throughout history, it was now time that we took an alternative look at the possible science behind these structures. Back in the 70s and 80s, a scientist called Joe Parr decided it was also time to take a look at the Great Pyramid, and pyramid shapes in general, and what he discovered is nothing short of amazing. In his experiments, Joe set up a model of the pyramid, aligned north, south and east, west, with flat coils placed on the north and south. A blown one microfarad capacitor was sparked across the gap using a battery, resistor and charge recorder. This was to simulate the electromagnetic energy of the Earth passing over the pyramid, what are commonly known as Earth energies. The scientists registered the changes on a daily basis, recording the bizarre phenomena of an energy bubble that surrounded the pyramid. Strangely, the energy actually stopped all kinds of radiation and the bubble showed attenuation to beta emitters, ion sources and magnetic sources when in the bubble. Feeding negative ions into the bubble actually intensified the energy. The energy was also found to alter over the course of the year and 13 years of experimentation gave good results. Most peculiar was the effect upon gravity, which is linked intrinsically to electromagnetic radiation. It appeared that the bubble actually blocked out the force of gravity as well as electromagnetic energy, showing a 113,000 times increase in kinetic energy, leading the researchers to theorise that the pyramid actually moved in time and space, a place known to theoretical physicists as hyperspace. Incredibly, when negative ions were fed into the bubble, the pyramid was drawn to the moon. Positive ions moved it away. An amazing correlation with the feminine and therefore spiritually negative aspect associated with lunar worship. The effect caused within the brain, which releases the hormones required for the trance state, is basically electromagnetic and is affected by all manner of ion activity. It therefore appears that the ancient serpent cult or shining ones were onto this in their own way, perceiving energy as the serpent wave and worshipping this invisible energy god as a snake. Eventually, gathering sufficient knowledge of this serpent energy they erected buildings that conducted the energy into a controlling element. With the effect of the plugs in the air vents having a resonance upon the electromagnetic energy, we can see how it could be specifically honed and finely tuned to create the effect. If this is true, then there must be other structures around the world with similar effects. One peculiar and little written about structure is the round tower. These round structures are worldwide and number in their hundreds, and strangely they are linked to the serpent in almost every instance. Tall, elegant round structures built by cultures as diverse as the Irish Celts and early Christians to the Hopi Indians and Egyptians, all of which are linked to serpent worship. In Ireland there are over 65 round towers, many over 100 feet and claimed by academics to be no more than 1,000 years old. However, as with most Christian buildings, they are generally built upon much more ancient religious ground and indeed 
Many of them can be proven to be older than first believed. Some even have churches built into them, as if to attach the church to the ancient serpent worship physically. St. Patrick kicked out the serpents from Ireland, and these serpents were indeed ancient serpent worshipping cult, the whole story being symbolic of the Christian church taking power. Historian and writer Gradwell in the 19th century pointed out that St. Patrick and his followers almost invariably selected those sacred sites of paganism and built their wooden churches under the shadow of the round towers, then as mysterious and inscrutable as they are today. Some claim these structures were fire temples dedicated to sun worship, and it is easy to see why, especially when we discover that sun worship is connected to serpent worship, the sun and the serpent being inner realities. Others claim them to be watchtowers, which would relate nicely to the ancient Sumerian and Semite term for the serpent cult as watchers. In fact, Hargrave Jennings, author of Ophir Latreia, relates them to the obelisk, that ancient phallic and serpent-derived pillar to the heavens. These towers are also found close by rivers, streams and holy wells. And this not only raises the question of earth energy caused by the water course, but also very telling because serpent deities were also associated with these watery places. Water was indeed the subterranean home of the serpent race and was the entrance to the underworld or other worlds, which is where the trance state was intended to take you. But it is this association with water which seems to be important to such structures and in terms of earth-related electromagnetic energy. There may indeed also be an important link between round towers and the Phoenicians who had similar structures dedicated to their rain and water deity Baal. There are thousands scattered across Sardinia, just north of the Phoenician city of Carthage, dating to at least 2,000 years before Christ. There are also those who believe that these round towers served as astronomical tools, like Stonehenge for instance, and this may also be the case. The towers in Iran, called Radkan, itself meaning serpent, are thought to be like these, and like the European towers of much later date, they have conical caps. In the Naga, or serpent homeland of India, we have sacred buildings like the Stupa, and in China, the Pagoda. Again, both these forms are really based on the same principles of earth energy as the round towers. In Feng Shui, we get a glimpse of the real use of the towers. The Pagoda, and indeed the Stupa, are thought to trap negative energy, or Qi, known as dragon or serpent energy, what we would call negative ions. Remember that these negative ions in Joe Parr's pyramid experiments were thought to cause anti-gravity and anti-electromagnetic effects. The Chinese tale of Lady Whitesnake is popular all over the world and is ultimately due to this electromagnetic energy. It is the Lady Whitesnake, or Lunar Snake, that is trapped in the pagoda for a thousand years. The giant's tower of Gozo, Malta, has also been related strongly by many historians to the towers of Ireland and Phoenicia. Early 20th century writer and historian Captain Oliver, when describing the Gozo Tower, said, It may be conjectured that these small holes may have been intended to hold small idols, whose trunks, made of stone or clay, are not dissimilar to the conventional female figures of Hindu representations on the numerous large and small rudely shaped conical stones which are found in these ruins. Somewhat similar to small pyramidical cones which 
by some have been supposed to represent the sun's rays, are to be seen in the hands of priests kneeling before the sacred serpent god in Egyptian paintings. More round towers can be found as far away as Southern America, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Chichen Itza, Africa and other places. All are related to the serpent energy and serpent cult, and many have the same astronomical alignments. Indeed, the Hopi snake tribe actually refers to them as snake houses. The Hopi god of death and the underworld has to explain to the snake mother why her children cannot live in the house. Could this be an indication of the death of the snake cult? Could this be the Hopi version of the St. Patrick's story? And if so, then it relates back to Ireland, where again there are hundreds of round towers connected with the serpent. If it is the case that these round towers or snake houses are seen across the Atlantic with the same religious and cultural grounding, then it is also true to state that the Anakin, the shining ones of Semite history, are also related in some way. Anak means long neck or necklace. The Hopi too have a similar word, anak, meaning necklace or earring. It is also an expression used when in pain from snake bite. Sumerian images of these anakim show them to have indeed long necks. But what about the science of the round towers? Is there anything that can be related to the energy discussed with the pyramids? In the book Ancient Mysteries, Modern Visions, Professor Callahan relays his research which amazingly shows that the round towers may have been designed as huge resonant systems for collecting and storing meter-long wavelengths of magnetic and electromagnetic energy. During World War II, Philip Callahan, PhD, was stationed in Ireland as a radio technician and was schooled as an entomologist. Callahan related how he believed that the ancient Hebrews and indeed Egyptians actually utilised the energy in rocks. He called these magical rocks, in the essence that they were deemed magical by the ancients due to their innate electromagnetic energy, which he believed they tapped into. The mythological and historical data would back up this theory. The ancients did see power residing in the stones and rocks in association with the earth and the surrounding universe. Using scientific methods, Callahan went on to rate various rocks according to measurements, with volcanic rock being more magical. He claimed that the ancients, including those of Celtic origin, understood the power of the magnetic healing forces, which we are only rediscovering today, and related this to the magnetic forces found within these stones. It has long been theorised that stone circles and ancient monuments are to be found on earth energy lines, known currently as ley lines. Many have theorised that these standing stones are magnetic acupuncture points upon the earth, and that by aligning them strategically, the ancients were building the energy pathway some unknown reason. Now we know the reason. The power within these rocks, according to Callahan, came from millions of years of grinding and crushing of drifting of tectonic plates and their energy was trapped within the minerals that make up the various materials. He claimed that these forces were known in ancient times by the Chinese as yin and yang, and by the Irish as fairies and leprechauns, the powers within the earth. This is the male and female, positive and negative energies. Callahan's credentials are nothing short of heroic. It was Callahan who discovered the tachyon, which many had said did not exist. This is a particle that actually moves faster than the speed of light. 
something we now know others to do via quantum entanglement. Callahan states that we must treat rocks and stone and even the soil as antenna collectors of magnetic energy waves. And it is this statement which revolves around the round tower theory as being earth antennas. It also points out that as fertile land is derived from volcanic activity, it too is an antenna, a flat one. Using this theory, he has gone on to show how practical applications can come from his research by improving the growth in plants and by using the magnetism in the soil. He even claimed that by building small round towers in the garden, we can help the growth of plants. Basing the hypothesis of his work on insect antenna and the capacity to resonate electromagnetic waves, Callahan hypothesized that the tall round towers were made to be earth antennas and that even similar buildings or structures around the globe could also be for the same reason. He believed that this energy would be passed on to those meditating at the site. It spurs along the trance-induced state and brings one closer to accessing the other world, whatever one might believe that to be. Of the towers tested in Ireland, Callaghan found that the iron-rich rock that they were made from indeed helped this effect along. The towers made from other materials such as limestone and granite were still, however, paramagnetic. Callaghan goes on to show how the rubble within these towers, which had baffled people for decades, was truly there as a tuning implement in much the same way that the plugs in the air vents of the Great Pyramid are probably fine-tuning plugs. Now we can see a picture building of ancient and not-so-ancient sites located around the planet from supposedly various cultures, but all with a unifying link of the serpentine energy field. Now we are beginning to understand the knowledge of these Atlanteans and the electromagnetic effects of the pyramids and round towers, we have to wonder about resonance and the sonic abilities of them. Researcher Boris Said is quoted as having said, Subsequent experiments carried out by Tom Danley in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid and in chambers above the King's Chamber suggest that the pyramid was constructed with sonic purpose. Danley identifies four resident frequencies or notes that are enhanced by the structure of the pyramid and by the materials used in its construction. The notes form an F-sharp chord which according to ancient Egyptian texts was the harmonic of our planet. Moreover, Danley's tests show that these frequencies are present in the king's chamber even when no sounds are being produced. They are there in frequencies that range from 16 hertz down to half a hertz, well below the range of human hearing. According to Danley, these vibrations are caused by the wind blowing across the ends of the so-called air shafts. In the same way as sounds are created when one blows across the top of a bottle. Strangely, we find the F sharp is actually the resonant chord of the earth and that the Egyptians knew this is startling. Mr. Said goes on in a separate interview to point out that Native American maker of sacred flutes from Oregon also make his flutes tuned to the key of F sharp.
We may also note that as Callahan had previously pointed out the importance of certain stones in connection to electromagnetism, the stones of these tuned passages were granite, a specific paramagnetic rock. The coffer in the king's chamber itself is attuned to the frequency of the pyramid, the very thing one would lay in. In 1988, Dr. David Diemer, Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, made another chance discovery. Collaborating on a science meets art project, Dr. Diemer attempted to find the vibrational frequencies for four base DNA molecules. Cutting all the technical science and bottom lining the whole thing, it was basically found that the pitch which shows up the most frequently and asserted itself as a tonic was F sharp, having been discovered three times in each base collection. It turned out that the frequencies in the base DNA are harmonically ordered and perfectly in line with the frequency of the Earth. A secret we have only just discovered, and yet ancient man seems to have known. It seems also that these peculiar frequencies turn out to be particularly pleasing to the ear, and indeed are thought to aid the healing process. Now, did the ancients, or Atlanteans, know of this correlation between harmonic stones the earth and even electromagnetism. Pythagoras gives us the answer from the 6th century before Christ. He described the stone as frozen music. His intuition apparently told him that the mathematics of frequency occurring in the planets, earth and other cycles were in tune and indeed told a story. At the base level, our bodies understand this, and at the heightened trance state, our minds do too. What the ancients did were to build structures which utilised the electromagnetic and harmonic effect, which work in unison with each other and us. They built in symbolism, power, grandeur, but also the universal harmonic and paramagnetic power. They even ritualized the whole thing into great and magnificent stories, fables, and even developed religions accordingly, worldwide. What they saw in those altered states was the double helix, the wave, the serpent, and it became the world's most powerful and wise deity. According to science, interaction under the influence of F-sharp actually allows the transference of energy, not only between individuals, but also from the very universe itself. But where is this energy really coming from, and what influences are occurring? The electromagnetic waves and particles, radio waves, or energy in short, is coming from every angle of the universe known, from the sun, the stars, and even the moon. Much of this energy is millions if not billions of years old. It acts in ways that we are only just beginning to grasp. As was seen in the discovery of the neutrino, over the course of millions of years, this constant interaction of energy particle waves has plotted the course of human evolution. No wonder that man believed his fate resided in the stars. We have become balanced genetically with the resonance of the universe and should therefore be able to understand the information we are receiving, even 
if not at a conscious level, but certainly at a superconscious level. This superconscious level is where we find the other world, which is the place of knowledge to all our ancients. This knowledge is from the very universe itself. It is basically profound to those who experience it, because it is God to them. It is the universal bank of knowledge that is growing and expanding all the time, and in every possible conceivable dimension. The whole system, the Earth and its electromagnetic sphere, the universe and its dynamic energy, and us, all interplay in a harmony of operatic proportions. The cyclic nature of the universe as a whole has already been shown on numerous occasions to affect us as a species, as well as all the other species living on the planet. Oysters open in harmony with the phases of the moon, regardless of their location. Humans are affected by an 11.1 year cycle, causing upsurges in war and disharmony, following closely the solar flares of the sun. If this is not energy information, being accepted and acted upon by the organic body, then what is it? It is claimed that the huge amount of information is constantly bombarding the human biosphere and that we do actually react accordingly, as we should after millions of years of evolution with these effects causing reactions within us. Over millennia mankind pondered all these things and more, healing, navigation, predicting weather patterns, psychological harmony. He developed groups of wise men we call wizards, magicians, priests. They held their knowledge as sacred, kept it secret, not just from their own tribes, but from others. The knowledge appeared otherworldly, as if sent from God. Today we would say the aliens brought the wisdom. The truth is, man is perfectly capable of gaining such wisdom himself. As tribes grew and spread, so too did the wisdom. It began in Mesopotamia and grew into civilization. It was taken out across the world and over thousands of years took root everywhere, from Egypt to Greece, from Northern Europe to the Americas, from China to Indonesia. Monoliths, megaliths, pyramids and sacred sites sprouted up and developed. All around us are the traces of this virtually hidden past. Astronomy, navigation, agriculture, philosophy and religion, all can find their roots in this mass migration. And then something strange happened. The memory of this faded and changed. History turned to legend and legend to fable. Then one day, somebody told the fable to a man called Plato and the search began to rediscover Atlantis. But they neglected to inform him that Atlantis was an idea, a wisdom, a thread of knowledge stretching back to the dawn of civilization. And so, to this day, we strive to discover a sunken land. But the truth is, Atlantis and its remains are all around us, wherever we live. We just need the eyes to see. Thank you.